All right, so people are trickling in still. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. We're going to probably wait just one or two more minutes um, as people kind of filter in. It's right around seven. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. I'll start off, I guess, uh, with just a thanks to our sponsors who are sponsoring our um, our series this winter. Um, Ski the Whites Shop in Jackson uh, has been great to us. Uh, definitely check them out. Uh, Granite Backcountry Alliance providing uh, some pretty awesome glade skiing in New Hampshire and in Maine. Um, check out what the work that those guys are doing. Um, CalTopo mapping software uh, has reached out to us and agreed to sponsor this series. We're psyched about that. Um, Snow Pit Technologies, who makes um, some, in my opinion, some of the best uh, avalanche field books that you can buy. Um, uh, who else? We get? And then we have some other uh, educational resources, some books that have uh, that are new that have just come out this year. Presidential Skiing um, by Kurt Neiler. And uh, I'm sure people have heard of that book. It's a great kind of visual guidebook of the White Mountains uh, ski terrain in the presidentials. Uh, the Ski Guide Manual written by IFMGA guide Rob Capolio. Uh, that's an, an awesome resource for the more advanced backcountry ski users. Check that out for sure. And, um, and the classic Best Backcountry Touring in the Northeast by David Goodman. Um, David just came out with a new updated version of his book. So we are psyched um, to have that. So let's see, we are right around, we've got a good amount of people in here. So I think we can kick it off. Um, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Mike is um, a longtime ski guide of over 20 years and he's an avalanche educator and he's worked um, pretty extensively in the search and rescue world as well as the avalanche forecasting world. And he's currently based in uh, the Chamonix area of France. And uh, one thing that's really cool about what he's doing is he is teaching American style uh, avalanche courses in the European zone. And um, if you've ever skied in Europe, things are a little different um, when it comes to avalanche forecasting and avalanche education. So um, it's really great what Mike has brought to that area. So we're, we're really excited to have him. He's a wealth of knowledge. And um, without any further ado, actually, the one thing I'll say before we before Mike gets rolling, if you have questions, uh, please enter them into the question and answer box. And uh, that's a little more easier for us to navigate than the chat. Um, and we will uh, get to those at the end. And, and Mike is uh, willing to take your, your questions live here. So uh, without any further ado, and somebody just asked, is it gonna be recorded? This will be recorded. Uh, so Mike, take it away. Great, thanks uh, Pat, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to, to, to be speaking uh, with, with uh, the East Coast uh, uh, ski and mountaineering community again. Um, so um, as Pat said, uh, uh, I'm a co-owner of a, an avalanche education company out here in the Alps and um, we deliver uh, kind of A3 American Avalanche Association level one and level two uh, rec courses out here. Um, and uh, been doing that now for, well, you know, neck end of uh, a decade now. Um, so, Avalanche awareness, where do we start? You know, if I'm, we're running a level one course, it, we've got three days with students, a level two course, four days, and it's like a fire hose of information that we're, we're pouring into those students, uh, both in a classroom sense in the morning, and then we transition into the mountains uh, sort of late morning and spend the rest of the day there. And we do that day after day. So how do I condense some of that key learning into 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 an hour well i guess one of the key things is to uh, be aware is that uh, as someone who's fairly new uh, to traveling in the winter back country is that we're kind of suckered into a false sense of security i would say and uh, you know we often transition from a a, a resort background 
And if we're in the resort, a lot of that avalanche uh, hazard is taken away from this. That's the whole point of the resort from the ski patrol's point of view is the mitigating the avalanche hazard for us. And so we get a, a, a skewed uh, idea of, of, of what is safe and, and what isn't. Uh, and it's kind of important to know that the backcountry really isn't um, a friendly environment. We need to start from the default position that we're operating in a hazardous environment. Um, and I think that's important to, to, uh, to, to remember. And I love this, this quote from Mark Smith from an essay that he wrote about forest firefighting, actually, as a, but not, not from an avalanche point of view. But uh, the quote in the essay is, is, is really interesting to me. So everybody here... Uh, you guys have all clicked on because you, you have an interest in, in avalanches and avalanche knowledge and improving your avalanche knowledge and your avalanche education. So I'm guessing everybody that's logged on here uh, this evening already knows a, a, a bunch of... Uh... Sorry, just... Uh, there we go. Everybody has uh, an idea of some nuggets of avalanche information they may be oh well you shouldn't ski for 24 hours after a storm or um you know northerly aspects in the heart of the winter are the dangerous aspects a lot of you guys will have key pieces of information and i kind of it's a little bit like uh, the hindustan uh uh adage of um the three blind guys, I don't know if you've heard it or not, and these three blind guys, they, uh, uh, they're in a room and someone brings an elephant into the room and they all start feeling the elephant, elephant individually. And the guy there feeling the tail on the elephant is like, is asked to describe an elephant. And he's like, well, an, an elephant's, uh, it, 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 it's skinny and swishy and uh, it's a bit like a snake. And another guy's, uh, feeling a tusk and he's like well no no it, it's skinny but it, it's really sharp and hard and they they're all right in the in their own uh, way um but they're all kind of wrong so how how do i in the next uh 45 minutes or so uh get to describe the whole elephant to you in a in a context that's that's going to work because as i say it, it, even in a, in, a, in, a, in a level one course, this is the kind of information we're trying to partake here. Uh, so I, I need to, some way of condensing that down for you. So I've got some five key uh, take home messages, if you like, that I think are, are kind of useful. Um, and what I like about them is, is that they're all ob obtainable and they're all really memorable. Some of them are really easy. The first one's really easy. You just go and buy some gear. Well, that's an easy thing to do because once that's done, you don't need to worry about it again, right? But, this, but like all of these five points I'm going to talk about uh, this evening, there's caveats. Um, and the caveat on this one is that you may already have some of this gear, but you need to reevaluate it. You need to make sure it's up to date and it's appropriate. It's personal protective equipment. It's PPE. It's your final line of defense of, of keeping your buddies alive and you, and you alive because you're hopefully the people that you're gonna be riding with are gonna have the same equipment. Um, and this is your last get out of jail card. So it needs to be right. Um, so uh, how old is that shovel that you're carrying? How appropriate is it? How old is the beacon that you're carrying? And we see loads of people turning up on our courses with really kit that's that that's that that's not fit for purpose especially beacons um and the question that i ask uh, a lot of these students is like well yeah you know it, 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 it it's it's sturdy it's it, you know it's a little old now it's a few years old and the question i ask is well how old is your mobile phone and invariably the mobile phone's a year old or two years old and, and that's okay for them but the thing that's going to save the lives or the lives of a loved one uh, or the best friend is it's okay for that to be 12 years old 
and have them never been serviced. So we need to be up to date with our equipment to make sure it's serviced and looked after right. Take those batteries out at the end of the season. Check for updates from the manufacturers. That there's always every year there's generally a, a software, a firmware update. Um, and important things to look for is that it's a three antenna beacon, uh, a three antenna digital beacon. Um, uh, and if you haven't got a three antenna digital beacon, then you should look uh, to buy a new one and retire that old one, take that old one and, uh, and just use it for training and practice. Because practice is the second part of, of, of this first tip, this first rule. Because even though these modern beacons are, are very intuitive, you know, I can, give, I can give a modern three antenna beacon to uh, a four or five year old child and he'll run around in the garden and find another beacon. Well, that's just a small part of the story because there's a, a lot more to practicing. We wanna practice in anger. We wanna practice with intention. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's great. You can hide it in the park and put it under some leaves, but really that's not achieving anything. Like I say a five-year-old can find that. What if that beacon's buried a meter in snow? That's gonna be a lot harder to find. Buried, but you know, on a, on a bad weather day, take that beacon, shove it in a, in, in a backpack, bury it down a meter, bury it down two meters. Your results will be massively different. Uh, it'll become much, much harder to find. You'll have to deploy, deploy your probe to find that, that rock sack in the snow. You'll need to deploy your shovel. It sounds like a crazy thing to say. It's like, well, I know I to put my shovel together, right? But if you think about the reality of an avalanche rescue, a real avalanche rescue is that our stress levels are through the roof and we don't operate in a normal way. Our, our fine motor skills start to deteriorate. Everything becomes really closed in uh, and that red mist descends and people make really bad uh, decisions and really kind of weird actions. We, we practice a lot with students on our courses and uh, we video them during rescues and they, they, they honestly can't believe what they're doing because even in a, in a, in a make-believe pretend scenario, the stress levels are elevated and we'll see really competent, uh, strong skiers, uh, people that have toured for years, not able to put the shovel together because they're shaking so hard and the peripheral vision is shut down. And it sounds crazy, but that's the reality of it. So what we're trying to do by practicing all the time is, by, is to infer, in, 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 engender a, a muscle memory uh, in our actions that things become rote, automatic. Deploying our pro becomes automatic. Going into search and being familiar with the sounds and visual feedback from our beacons is automatic. And to do your hand for it to, to operate like that, we need to practice with real intention. Uh, we need to set ourselves up little scenarios. And those scenarios actually are quite good fun. If it's a crappy weather day, um, it's, 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 it's a good thing to do. It's a fun little thing to do is to set up a little scenario. Um, now, the other thing about, as well as Beacon Shovel Probe that I would like to mention is, um, if you look to the right of this photograph, there's a set of skins. And I'll always say Beacon Shovel Probe and skins. Well, why is that? Uh, so even if I'm doing a, a day lift accessed and I'm gonna do hit a bit of side country and then cut back into bounds, it may be the temptation is, is not to carry skins with me. Skins are actually a really useful thing to have what happens if you're with somebody and you ski a line and the second skier or the third skier down the line that one of your buddies triggers off an avalanche and you have to go back up the hill to effect a rescue? Yeah, are you, what are you gonna do, post hole? Two, three, 400 yards uphill? Or are you gonna to transition to skins? What if you're dropping off a ridge line into, into something and uh, it starts to feel a little squirrely? What if you're like, mm, man, this is a little bit, the snow's not right, I'm not liking this, I wanna come back up to the ridge. Well, if you've got the skins, that's a quick and easy thing to affect. But if you haven't, what are, what's, what's our predisposition? It's like, well, if, I don't wanna boot pack back all the way up there again. 
it's going to take me half an hour. I don't really like the snow, but it'll be fine. So the skins give us a margin. Uh, and for what they cost weight wise, especially if we're going to be skiing off a lift and we're carrying a pack anyway because we need it for our shovel and our probe, we'll just shove a pair of skins in there. The cost is, is nothing and the potential benefit is potentially really quite high. So why not? So I'd say there's my first tip is beacon shovel probe, but also a set of skins as well. And I think having all of those together means that we can practice in anger. Uh, as I say, it's quite good fun to set up little scenarios. This is a photograph of, 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 of a level one course. Operating in teams, practicing with, the pe with your regular ski buddies is really useful because communication is a really key part of, 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 of avalanche rescues. Um, so uh, yeah, go out and practice because if the worst does happen, then we want to be really on our game. This is our, our last line of defense, so it needs to be right. This is the one we want to practice. And what I would say is that um, after this uh, seminar, if you're thinking about booking a course um, and you're not sure what course to book, you know, the cheap, easy way into doing a course is, is an avalanche rescue course, the one day arc course. Um, generally, they're pretty cheap because uh, avalanche schools can get a bunch of people together. They need a lot of people to run these scenarios. And so cost-wise, um, that works out not much money per person. Uh, I don't know what they're running in the States, but we're charging less than a hundred bucks uh, over here uh, for a one day art course for people. And uh, you're gonna get a good day. You're gonna learn a huge amount. You're gonna get a lot of learning uh, for, 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 for your money. So uh, if you're thinking about doing more in the back country, which you are because you're here listening to me rabbit on, then my tip is go take an art course or go book yourself an art course. You'll not regret it. You'll, and, you know, and we get people that come back and do art courses every couple of years with us because they feel they're so valuable. They want to hone up their skills better than they could do themselves. They know that will set up really strong scenarios, uh, complex scenarios. Uh, and uh, they, they find that really useful. So, yeah, should the worst ever happen, then those skills are your last line of defense. And so they need to be right. And my second tip, my second rule would be take a course. We've just said take an art course, right? But yeah, but maybe also take a level one as well. What I can tell you in an hour is trying to condense all of this stuff. It, it just really is trying to get an outline of the elephant, right? A level one over three days, um, you'll really start to want to get to grips with it. Because taking by taking a course, uh, you'll start to pick up some of the nuances about the avalanche forecast, about the feedback of the weather. Um, sounds a little bit dry, but when we're running the courses, we're getting a lot of skiing in as well. And you're getting guided skiing. So you're going to be shown places that you may not have been before. You'll be taken to places that are going to offer good skiing, hopefully. So think of it as cheap guiding. Um, so look at the price of that course and think, well, if I hired a guide for, the, for, for, for those three days, how much would that cost, cost? And if you look at it that way, kind of the course is free. Uh, so, so, so why wouldn't you? Um, when I talk about a course, I'm talking about a course with a provider, not an online learning model. I think it's really important that your avalanche education is involved on the mountain, getting your hands into snow, getting a feel of terrain. We can talk about cornices, we can talk about surface hall, we can talk about uh, wind slab. And we can look at videos of wind slab and surface hall and cornices but there's no substitute for getting your hands on and feeling that stuff, right? There's no substitute of being put into avalanche terrain with somebody, with a, with, with a trainer, with an instructor who can bring that alive to you in, in, in a way that 
a book or, or, or an online uh, tutorial can't. So yeah, you definitely want to take a course by one of the recognized providers, AAI or AERI, um, that has a, a, a quite clear definitions of group ratios, what they're going to cover subject wise, but also generally these courses all offer around, suggest about 60% of the time of, of the course should be on the mountain. And that's where we have fun, right? So, you know, you don't want to be stuck all day in a classroom. Um, you want to be actually out on the mountain. And that's where the best learning occurs. Um, and, you know, you can get up close and personal to, to, uh, uh, to avalanches. You'll get into avalanche terrain. No substitute for it at all. Brilliant. So get the equipment, uh, practice how to use it, take a course and you'll practice how to use that equipment uh, again. Uh, you'll, you, you'll get some one-to-one -one instruction possibly, certainly on an art course, you'll get one-to-one -one instruction on, on, on your particular beacon and how to use it effectively. Um, so those one and two, they kind of go together quite nicely. The third thing out of this five, these five key things that we want to talk about is, is information gathering. Nah, it's not so interesting, right? But again, it's free. And whereas one and two aren't free, number three is free. Um, there is a huge amount of resources out there with the internet at your disposal. And certainly on the level one and, and level two in particular, we try and teach a process. And the process always starts with information gathering. Um, so uh, Mount Washington Avalanche Center is updating its forecast daily. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are in, in the States, there's always gonna be uh, an avalanche forecast for the mountainous region or, or virtually everywhere for the for, for virtually every mountainous region you'll have the ability to click onto an avalanche forecast that's that's timely that's relevant to your specific area uh and so and it's being provided by by a group of experts so why wouldn't you suck up that resource it's you know it's golden those guys have been up there the day before They've been studying the snow. They've been there the day before, but they've been out there for the last week, for the last month, for the last three months. Uh, every day going through the same process, time and time again, creating for themselves a very rich information picture of the snowpack and the avalanche danger. So why wouldn't you tap into that? And um, it's quite interesting. Uh, I did some work with uh, the in Scotland um, a few years ago now, quite a while ago now, but when we looked at um, the time that people spent on the Avalanche Services website, it was a, it was a, a ridiculously small period of time. It was under, for, for something like 80% of users, it was less than a minute. A lot of users were clicking on for for 15 or 30 seconds. What they were looking at was the headline figure. Uh, they were seeing what the avalanche hazard was, moderate, considerable. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a considerable day today. Uh, I, I, I best kind of dial it back and then clicking out. And yet on that website was a whole wealth of information about conditions, about riding conditions, what part of the area the riding conditions were best at, what aspects gave the best riding just gold photographs of riding conditions would be up there. No interest to these people. Just what's the headline figure and I'm away. If we're serious about having fun, then it's a pretty serious business, right? The, you've got to work to get your fun. And part of that work is that information gathering process. So get onto your regional avalanche forecast area onto MWAC and just suck it dry of information. Start clicking around there. And even two, three, four days before your trip, if you're gonna go out there on a Saturday, looking up the weather coming in, the avalanche forecast on the, on, on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's not unreasonable. You wanna see what that trend's doing. Is the problem getting better or is it getting worse? Um, is it the same avalanche problem they're reporting every day? 
All of that is gold information that we want to dig out there. There's a bunch of other information resources as well, right? It's not just the Avalanche Center that we can glean information from. We can see other sources of information though. Uh, it, social media is great these days. Like, and I'm kind of, I get half of my Avalanche information before I go out in the day, the night before from social media. Trusted sources on social media, people that, that are, I know aren't going to tell me it's like as an amazing powder day again. I want to get onto the Instagram feeds and the Facebook feeds of of guides, of forecasters, of pro skiers that are, are, are trustworthy that are in the region. Here we have Ski the Whites' feed. You know that's going to be a reliable, solid feed. Look at the photographs that are being presented there on his feed. Picture tells a thousand worlds, right? I can look at those photographs and I get a good feeling of conditions, what's in, what's not, um, what might be a good place to go. So I'll start off with my regional avalanche forecast, but then I'll populate that information picture by using social media and other weather forecast areas as well. Let's have a look now at uh, the Mount Washington, uh, excuse me, the Mount Washington avalanche forecast. So, as avalanche forecasters, we're kind of aware of, of, of how the public interact with us, and we're trying to year on year try and improve the surface and whack of, of change the, 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 the presentation this year because um, we, you know, we're trying to be engaged as forecasters, we're trying to, to engage as best we can. So the bottom line here is that's the takeaway point. They know that a large percentage of people clicking onto the site are only going to be there for 30 seconds or a minute. So I better give them the headline news right away and then hopefully they'll get that right. So that's why we get the kicking off with the bottom line here. Um, and it's a really information dense couple of paragraphs. There's a lot more information in the background uh, but they know a lot of people are only taking away the bottom line. So that's why it's so dense and that's why it's up front. But as we've just discussed, you guys aren't going to do that. You guys are better than that, right? You're going to, uh, you're going to get in there and you're going to start looking at some of the details. And it's telling us that here, the danger on this, uh, this one from uh, last year, from February last year, uh, this report that I've just pulled off at random, is that the danger will rise to considerable in the afternoon as wind and snow combine to create wind slaps. So it's telling you what the avalanche problem is, and it's telling you how big a problem it is, it's gonna be considerable. But, well, well, but that's fine, but what's, what's considerable? Well, if we take a course, we'll know, but let's talk about that. Considerable, well, that's just the middle one, right? It's number three out of five. It's, it's, it's just kind of getting rowdy in the powdy, right? It's not so difficult. It's not so bad. I, we can handle the middle problem, right? It's not like it's five out of five. It's three out of five. Doesn't really work that way. So I think, you know, certainly on, the, on our level ones, what we're trying to impart here is an understanding of the danger scale. It says European danger scale here, but the, the, the European one now mirrors the American one. Uh, Basic, basically the same. Um, so uh, on the American uh, danger scale, the definition of considerable is uh, natural triggered avalanches. That's avalanches happening without us being involved, just occurring by themselves is possible. And a human triggered avalanche is probable. That's a much more descriptive way to describe that problem, right? It's, think about the word, it's considerable. If there was a considerable chance of you getting stabbed if you went down a dark alley, you probably wouldn't go down the dark alley, right? Um, but because in certain weather systems, uh, it's considerable day after day after day, we feel that it's like, well, it's always considerable here. Well, the reason why it's forecasters, forecasting it as considerable is because it's considerable. We also need to think how these danger ratings interact with each other. 
it might be tempting to think that it goes from low to moderate to considerable and it's a stepped kind of scale. Well, it's not that simple. Look at the difference here on this chart here between say a low three in relation to the avalanche danger and a high three. We don't know what the forecasters pre process is. Maybe that for those forecasters that morning have been debating whether to call it high. Is it high? Does it fit the definition of high? Kind of does, but not quite. It could be high. Well, it's not really high. It doesn't quite fit our criteria to make it high. It's considerable, but it's there considerable. Right. Big difference between being there on the scale and being down here, just a step up from moderate. How do we know where we are on that considerable scale? We've got to delve in. We've got to go into the bottom line that's been geared to us and pull that information out, but then go further again. What's our avalanche problem? Not all avalanches are equal. A new snow avalanche problem is in many ways much more manageable than something like a persistent weak layer. Now, at this stage, we're, we're not going to tell you to say, well, it's OK to go out on considerable for a new snow, but not considerable for a persistent weak layer. But by delving in and looking at the avalanche problem that's being presented by the Avalanche Centre, and think back to that bottom line, that slide a couple of a couple of slides ago, they told us it was considerable, and then they told us what the considerable it was considerable for. They said it was for wind slab, wind drifted snow. And then when we delve in, the avalanche forecast will tell us where that problem is. It's grayed out on the avalanche rows. We call this circle the avalanche rows. And basically it's a helicopter bird's eye view of the mountain. So imagine we're looking down, we're at 10,000 feet looking down on top of Mount Washington. And that's the north slopes of Mount Washington, northeast slopes of Mount Washington, west slopes of Mount Washington. And here they're telling us the grayed out slope. The avalanche problem is wind slab. And it's the wind slab is going to be present from north all the way through to south. That side of the avalanche problem is where the considerable avalanche danger exists. So guess what? If I go west, I don't need to worry about wind loaded slopes. Now, I might not get great skiing there, but I know it's safe. So I've got that in my back pocket, right? I get that information by just delving that little bit deeper into the avalanche forecast. And there we have some spiel at the bottom that'll give a richer picture to this avalanche rose. But I really like the avalanche rose. It's a really powerful visual tool for me because I'll now carry that away in my head as I go into the mountains. I'll think, well, well that, where was that avalanche danger? What aspect am I on? In addition to the aspect, it'll give us the elevation. Sometimes the avalanche danger will just be on north and northeast, but above three and a half thousand feet, right? Below three and a half thousand feet, that danger won't exist. So again, I can start to visualize that. And also be aware that if there's more than one problem, going on, there'll be a secondary problem and a second avalanche rose for you to digest. So now it's like, oh man, this is kind of getting a little complicated now. I've got trying to visualize my wind slab on north through to south, but also I need to visualize a wet slab problem. It's starting to become a little bit more complex. Very difficult to drag that information out of a 30 second, one minute hit on the site, right? If we're, if we're going to absorb that information and implement it into our day out, be it the following day or a couple of days later, we need to spend a little bit of time with it. This is why planning is so important. Um, we can't do it on the fly. We have to do it the night before. Even the morning uh, that we're going in can be kind of problematic, a little bit problematic. Uh, so we may need to get out of bed that little bit earlier, right? To let it absorb in as we're, as we're sat down and, uh, and frying up our bacon, we can 
we could just like an email back and someone's just like, right, let's just go through this. Okay, now what's the weather saying? I'd looked at the social media last night and now what's the latest? I saw the, I saw the average forecast yesterday and the day before. How has it changed today? Now we're starting to have a rich picture of information of what we're likely to encounter, where we should go, not to just get safe riding, but good riding, right? Because that's what it's about, right? Safety first, no, no, riding first, safety second. If safety was first, we'd stay at home and, and, and watch TV because that's way safer from an avalanche point of view. The whole object of this is that we get out and we get great riding. So use this resource, this information gathering resource to, to improve your riding. Yeah, not just to keep you safe, but to get the best day out you can get. Why wouldn't you? Check out what the weather's doing. The avalanche forecast is dependent on the weather forecast. As an avalanche forecaster, I'm scouring all my weather information sources and I'm dependent on them. And if the weather forecast is wrong, then that's gonna affect my avalanche forecast. So if the avalanche forecast is, is talking about winds picking up in the afternoon and you're seeing that front being delayed, that weather front being delayed and it's not happening, well, they said it was going to be sunny in the afternoon and, and, and it's it it going to really cook the south slopes, but it's it's snowing this afternoon. Do we think the problem of, of, of wet loose and wet slab on south aspects is going to apply? No. The avalanche forecast is wrong because the weather forecast is wrong. So, you know, we make our own decisions here. Um, the Avalanche forecast is a great information source, super, super valuable, but, uh, you know, we need to supplement it and even challenge it from time to time. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, we can only, you know, as an Avalanche forecast, we can only go on the information that we have. Uh, and if that information is wrong, then, 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 you know, it definitely affects our avalanche forecast. So, yeah, so another avalanche, a good, a good weather source, uh, Mount Washington Observatory, what they're putting out, NOAA, bunch of other third party uh, avalanche resources out there that are mountain specific, ski specific. They're, they're telling us temperatures at certain elevations. They're giving us a trend uh, of, of temperatures and the weather coming in. Some great resources out there. Just put them, bookmark them. That's part of your planning process. Sop that information up. And you know, talking about that information rose, right? And it's like, God, it's getting complicated. Now, how do I plan? What aspect, you know, what aspect actually is Tuckerman's? It's like, yeah, like yeah. well, no, is it is it east or is it no, it's not, no, it's more of a well, there's some great resources out there. When we're, when we're looking at the roads, we want to look at a map as well to see where we're going. Well, now there's, there's great 3D modeling, totally free, totally available online. This is Fat Map. We've worked with them a lot. An amazing resource from a backcountry uh, 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 snowshore, ice climber, skier point of view. Brilliant. Look what this, look what, the, if you're not familiar with it, look what this can do. So here we're looking in at, uh, but uh, Tuckerman's in here. This is Tuckerman Tox Ravine and uh, Boot Spur Trail going up here. Uh, and so, okay, that's I can zoom in. I can see my lines. That these photos are from, uh, are aren't current. They're not from today. The high resolution photographs uh, that may be several months old, but they have summer and winter modes. Look what I can do now. My avalanche problem from Winslow was north through to south. So I'm interested in wind slab being on blue through to red. What aspect I'm looking for this color and that color and that color to be safe. Where can I go there that picks that up that's safe? Hmm, actually on that avalanche forecast, there's very little riding I can do in and around Tuckerman's, right? Very little. Golfer slides. That's out too. Right, okay. Where can I go? Maybe I need to start thinking of a different venue for today with that forecast. I can just dismiss that. See how valuable a resource, uh, a layer like this, a 3D modeling tool like this can be. Well, you know, as if it's not steep enough to slide, it can't slide, right? You may have heard one of those nuggets of feeling around your elephant may be that, well, if it's 
under 30 degrees, it can't avalanche. That's very true. So another layer on fat map is, is, is avalanche angle layer, right? Here, here's everything that's 30 degrees and above. Let's look at stuff in there that we can, we can ski that's low angle. Well, okay, there is kind of some stuff that maybe even on those wind slab aspects, we may be able to, to kind of get into. That said, we need to be careful of what's connected to our low angle slopes, right? Down here in Tuckermans, it's low angle, it's sub 30. But look what's above us. It's not just what we're on, it's also what's above us that can come down on top of us. But these tools are very, very, very powerful, very valuable tools, much uh, more effective than a normal map, I would say. And I know Cal Topo, who's one of the sponsors of this series, they have these layers as well. Uh, these uh, these angle layers uh, are very useful, very useful. So, uh, you know, there's so much information out there that, uh, you know, a nerd like me, uh, my preparation will be the night before, might be up to a couple of hours to just kind of to give myself a, a, a goal that, that will fit in with the avalanche problem, but also what's going to give me the best riding. If that doesn't pan out, what's my plan B? And if that doesn't pan out, what's my plan C? That's maybe a different aspect and a different elevation, just so I can get uh, some good skiing out of the day. Um, so valuable resources. Um, that's that's the third one we, we, we talked about there. Cool. Yeah. And the fourth one is when we're out on the mountain, when we've done our planning, hopefully when we've had a course, when we've got a, a beacon shuffle probe and skins on our pack, when we get out there, finally, um, we've got to listen to the mountain, right? What's the mountain telling us? Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, look at this photograph here. What do you think the feedback from the mountain is here? It's like, damn, yeah. Things are looking pretty spicy, right? Maybe he, I don't want to ski this slope. That's getting feedback from the mountain. What kind of feedback are we talking about? Well, this is a card that that, that we made up uh, last year and we give out to our students. And, and really this card does nothing more than um, give, highlight some of the feedback that we're talking about. Here we go up here. It's like, are we seeing wind transported snow? Today I was out and about and I was down in the tree line and it was a calm, beautiful day. But when I looked up to the mountain, into the alpine, onto the ridge line, I could see snow rotoring off. Well, where's that snow going? It's coming, from, it's being taken from one place, being put to another, setting up wind slab, right? Is, is my terrain greater than 30 degrees? Get that feedback. Has it snowed recently, new snow? What temperature is it? Am I hot? Is the rapid warming going on? Am I needing to put sunscreen on here? Am I getting those shooting cracks like the last slide? Am I seeing recent avalanche evidence? Does that avalanche debris look new? Is that avalanche on an aspect that I thought I was going to ski today? And if so, is it such a good idea to ski on it? Because if the avalanche has just released naturally, what's going to happen to the slope next to it when I jump on it? I've got to keep our our eyes about us, we've got to get that constant feedback. That's not just at the beginning of the day when we first get out there. I'm reevaluating, I'm taking that information, feeding it back into the mill, adding it to the information I, I took last night, right? The, uh, when I looked at Fat Map and I looked at the social media and I looked at Matt, uh, Matt, Matt Washington Avalanche Center's report, I'm just adding that information because that information that I took the night before at best or the morning. Uh, you know, from MWAC, that, that this information is already a day old. The best information is the stuff that I'm seeing right here, right now on this slope that I'm about to ski. That's, that's bullseye information. That's better than anything else. I'm right here, right now. It's, that's as current as it gets. So, you know, we need to be constantly looking and reevaluating. And if we see stuff, the temptation is to be like, well, it's probably okay. No, if you've got a concern, if you're seeing any of these classic warning signs, you might have heard of Alp Truth, right? Aspect, um, elevation, 
uh, it, yeah, that all of these things are covered, in, a lot of this stuff is covered in outros, right? So, you know, if, if these things are, are triggering up, if we're getting two or three of these things, then we really need to be thinking, have I got my planning right? Or, you know, should I really be here? Get that feedback from the mountain. You know, well, if there's a cornice here, that means the wind's blowing from the other direction and it's rotated in here. This means we're now on a wind-loaded slope. Okay, I, I know that's not necessarily great, but it might be okay. But now I'm getting one thing as I'm kicking into that. Okay, and now the shooting cracks and maybe we need to back off. See how it works? Get information, get feedback. Shove them back into the machine, into the mill and reevaluate. It's not just from a skiing point of view, from an ice climbing point of view. Get that feedback as well. Do the same planning, the same preparation as an ice climber. The, the, the avalanche doesn't care if you're a skier or a climber or a snowshoe or, or a snowmobile, right? The process is exactly the same. Is it colder or war, warmer than, you know, it was forecast to be, you, you know, 32 uh, today, but it's like, I'm in thin, I've got a thin fleece on and a, and a little Pertex shell and I'm cooking here on the belay. How warm is it? It's, it's like, I think we're in the forties. Like this, this, this ice is dripping. It's the same thing, right? Get the feedback. And if it's not right, if it's not fitting in with your plan, then do something about it. The big one, the big key, the smoking gun is recent avalanche activity. If you're seeing recent avalanche, avalanche activity naturally, or if you're kicking off bits of bits of corners and stuff's propagating away, or, or, or you're seeing other people setting off little sloughs uh, or little, little pockets of, of wind slab, that should be a red flag. So that's that out of those those warning signs, out of those out of those Alp truth signs that you may be familiar with. Recent avalanche activity. That's that's the real key one uh, on slopes that you go that you, that you're going to be looking to to travel. Yeah, good. And finally, the last one is travel safely. Wow, how does that differentiate from? getting feedback from the mountain. Well, you know, that's our one at a time, skiing with a, a solid ski partner that has Beacon Shovel Probe, hopefully he's taken a course that you can have a facilitated discussion with that isn't gonna be skinning away, uh, you know, a hundred yards ahead of you. It's like, yeah, let's go down here, let's go there. And he stripped his skins on and he's already ready to, 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 to huck his meat off the lip before you've even got there and you're huffing and puffing. That's not a good ski partner. That's not traveling safely. These protocols, one at a time and islands of safety, keep us safe in, in, in avalanche terrain. So um, they're, they're, they're really valuable. Stacking up in, in good places um, that's out of avalanche danger. These two ladies here have stacked up there's no avalanche danger above them. Anything that's going to happen is going to happen beneath them or it's going to happen in this, this, this shot that they've skied down and now they've pulled out. And you can see there's a bit of sloughing that they've set off coming up before they've popped around here. So hot, wet conditions. And now they're going to ski the next pitch one at a time, keeping an eye on each other. Because effectively, if we're not doing that, then we're skiing alone. And that beacon shovel and probe are no use at all, right? If I'm skiing ahead and I'm skiing out of sight and you don't know where I've gone, then effectively at that point, I'm skiing alone. Yeah. And it's like, oh, do you think, do you think he's okay? Shall we wait for him to pop out of the bottom? Yeah, he's probably having a breath. So how we travel in the terrain is really important, right? For sure. How we travel in that terrain is really important using islands of safety and not mental islands of safety, not that little kind of sapling there. So I'll just tuck behind this little tree here and you know, this bush here. And if things start to go rowdy, I'll just, you know, the avalanche comes to, white reaper comes to grab me. I'll just hang onto this bush. That's not going to work. 
nor is that two, two foot high rock an island of safety, nor necessarily is that six foot high rock. Islands of safety are big mature trees, terrain features like the last photograph with the two ladies, solid rock architecture that you can tuck beneath. And when you tuck it beneath them, get right in close. Yeah, you don't want a three, four foot, you see people stacked like three foot, four foot away from each other. So if there's three skiers, like the, the third skier is like six foot away from the island of safety. He's not an island of safety. Like the first person in the island of safety, the other two people believe them, but they're not an island of safety. Get in tight to that island of safety, everybody. Get in, if use that, those island of safety properly. Um, use that terrain efficiently. And if there isn't an island of safety and there isn't a terrain feature, ski the whole shot. Ski it all the way out. If anything happens with our body or, you know, they twist a knee or whatever, we've got our skins, right? We can go back up and help them. But if the only safe place is, is three, four, five hundred feet at the bottom of the shot on the clear run out away from any avalanche danger, well, ski to that. If you can't ski at a single push, that's fine. Ski half of it, get your breath, ski the other half, and the next skier do that. Nothing wrong with that at all. So there we have five key things that are hopefully putting a little bit of flesh on the elephant, right? So how do we incorporate that and, and make decisions from that? Well, that's really a hard, hard, hard question. And I've got two or three minutes left to, 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 to talk about that and I can't really give it justice. Um, and, you know, take a course, tip two, we'll, talk an awful lot, especially when you're in the mountains, about how we make decisions. But decisions ultimately come around terrain, the terrain that we choose to put ourselves into, right? We choose our terrain, right? We may not be able to choose the snowpack and we may not be able to choose the weather, but we can certainly choose the terrain we put ourselves amongst, okay? When we have questions about being safe from avalanche, if snowpack is questionable, then terrain will always be our answer, yeah? And we choose. So we have ultimate power over that. So go back to our five things, right? Uh, number three, gathering information. We know what the avalanche hazard is. That should impact the kind of terrain we choose, right? If it's a considerable day, then really we don't want to be in big, high consequence terrain. Remember, considerable avalanches, natural avalanches possible, human triggered avalanches probable. That's not the time to be skiing amongst glaciers on steep, Couloirs with high consequence run out into trees, over cliffs, right? We need to choose our terrain. That low angle terrain is much more appropriate for a considerable avalanche hazard, right? Meadow skipping. You still get great rewards in low ter hazard terrain, right? So, um, and then should we be in there? Well, kind of experts only, really. You're really kind of uh, pushing pushing your boundaries and cutting out your margins by putting ourselves in that kind of terrain. And this is a matrix that we have for our students, but it's, it's a fairly generic risk, uh, risk matrix for, uh, for Avalanche Canada. The Canadians do a really good one uh, just like this. Um, so uh, maybe that's something to think about as part of your planning stage is to have a, an index like this. It's like, well, it's the saying it's considerable. What, what I've got in mind, is that appropriate? Maybe, maybe, is it, is it medium terrain? Is it challenge terrain or is it simple terrain? Simple terrain has good, clean run outs. It doesn't have overlapping avalanche problems. It's like I say, it's meadow skipping or, or you know, somewhere like this in Iceland, it can be a quite a big mountain, but it, it kind of benches and we're not gonna see big avalanches uh, materializing from simple terrain and that's important because when avalanches do occur in simple terrain they've got nowhere to run there's not enough snow to create a big avalanche and the terrain doesn't let those avalanches run for great distances and what's nice about simple terrain is there's lots of options around i can cut 
various ways. There may be low angle options all around me. I can drop off the back, I can move to the side, I can keep the angle low because we know from one of those nuggets from feeling around the elephant is that on the 30 degrees, really can't avalanche, yeah? So that's what I'm talking about, simple terrain. Whereas challenging medium terrain is kind of similar, but bigger, kind of makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, but generally, there's not much, it's certainly not glaciated, there's not much in the way of, of big high alpine mountains. I've got, definitely I've got options here to, to keep angles low. Uh, I can see that maybe there's big terrain above me, but I'm kind of not connected to it. It's kind of, it's the halfway house between meadow skipping and, and full on rowdy alpine, right? You know, I can work around problems. There may be problems, there may be cliffs, but I can generally work around them. Or certainly the consequences of being caught in an avalanche of medium terrain will fan me out into big open spaces, not into terrain traps such as gulches and creek beds or into trees, because we don't want to be avalanched into trees, right? Because of the trauma, uh, we're not going to be avalanched. Uh, we, we, we're not going to be avalanched into crevasses or, or anything like that. So it's a halfway house between simple and complex terrain, and then complex terrain. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great photograph of, of you know, it's not of, of, of you know that now we're into complex terrain. Look at the availability of snow above us. The skier here started from here, but there was still a big amount of snow above them to avalanche, which it did do. And it's a, such a big uh, scale that we're now operating in in complex terrain is that avalanches can go really big. And when by really big, they then become really destructive. They become unsurvivable. All right. Uh, if you do do one of your courses, they'll talk about a D rating, a destruction rating, which relates to the size of the avalanche. Like a you know a D three uh, can you know can smash up a a, a a a car. Right. It can take a car. It can it, it can beat up a car. D four can 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 derail a train. This is a D four avalanche. This an avalanche this size would would do take a train off its track. Is that a survivable avalanche as a skier or a snowmobile? No, we can't survive that. So by moderating the terrain we choose, then you know we reduce the avalanche danger inherently by doing that. And that's why that little matrix there um, of uh, that we see here is that to, we need to moderate that terrain to the avalanche uh, danger rating that we have for that day. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. And then if we port all of this information together, you know, if we follow those five steps, having the equipment, getting some training, gathering our information, looking out for uh, those warning signals, getting the feedback from the mountain, traveling safely with a good team and an appropriate terrain, then that's, that's you know, that's, that's the secret to success. Because, um, you know, we've got to be in it for a long time as well as a good time. Yeah. We put all of those things together. And that's how we arrive at our decision. Where, when and what shall we ski today? Yeah. Having the equipment, having the training, um, knowing where the problem is, knowing what the problem is. And that's that's when we can go big. All right. So thanks very much. Uh, have, be safe. Have a great winter. Thank you. Mike, thanks so much as usual. Um, that was a phenomenal presentation. Uh, we do have some awesome questions here from some, right. folk, some folks in the audience, um, if you're willing to take those. And um, I would say also, if, if you wanna ask a live question, um, we can bring you on. So you can um, use the hand raise feature after we get through a couple of these typed questions. And uh, we, we're happy to do that as well. So the first one, uh, Mike, without getting too into the weeds here, because we realize as we get into these topics, we open up just more and more cans of worms and there, there's a lot of depth to uh, avalanche education. But can you just briefly um, talk about uh, the use of slope cuts as a defensive measure against slabs? And that's from Andrew Hyman. Uh, yeah, good question. It, <clears throat> it, it's an advanced skill. Um, ski patrollers are generally really good at it and the reason why they're good at it is that they get to practice it in the same place uh, every day 
and they know when they're making good cuts and when they're not making good cuts and it's really difficult to apply that skill um, when you've not had that kind of background that said um, if I'm about to drop into something then I'll, cut, I'll always cut it anyway because even if I make a mess of it then the avalanche is kind of beneath me and not above me if that makes sense so I will make an aggressive cut but it's it, it, it's a tough skill and it's not to be played with and and on the east coast it's doubly problematic because it's a really good skill out west when we have soft slabs because those soft slabs break our feet and cut away like we imagine they're going to do. But if we're dealing with a hard slab, like a hard wind slab, and a lot of the slabs over on the east coast there are that, then when they fracture, a hard slab will often fracture above us and then we'll be right in the slab as it goes. So in our mind, as we cut the slab, it's just going to cut soft at our feet. But if it turns out to be a hard slab and we really wait and hit that snow, that snow and it fractures above us, then, then, then we're in a world of pain. Um, yeah, um, practice with caution. And when you're trying to learn that skill, look at the consequences of what's beneath you. If you get it wrong, where you're going to end up, play mini golf with it to practice. Um, there's some good videos on, on how to do it right and that, that, that they're better than me to trying to explain how to do it right. Yeah, I'd also say, you know, if you haven't done that before and, and probably, um, you know, don't try it by yourself and you really, it's a good idea to have a mentor who yeah. has done that a lot before yeah. you um, to yeah. kind of coach you through doing that. It's an advanced skill. Okay, a um, couple more here. One of them, is, let's see. Uh, uh, this is a good question from Wes. How do you think, uh, how do you think about translating mountain level avalanche problems so bigger scale avalanche problems to smaller scale features uh, like within a ravine um well i guess i'm not really sure what you mean by i think maybe uh, uh, along the lines of um kind of micro forecasting for terrain features versus the general yeah. forecast of of a range okay yeah yeah so i guess you know what i didn't say in the presentation there is that uh, avalanche centers uh, don't forecast for a slope. They'll forecast for quite a large area. Some areas are extremely large. Um, I think up in Canada, one of the forecast areas is like the Yukon. It's like, you know, the size of Western Europe. They're trying to avalanche forecast. Um, so we need to understand that the, the, the forecast that, uh, that you're reading there is, is, is very much on a larger scale. It's, and this is where those other skills, those five things I was talking about, right? That's where you come, your interpretation comes on that. And it's building up a picture over a number of days. That's kind of key. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for a, a specific feature, uh, maybe if you're looking to ice climb in a specific ravine um, that's got high consequences from, from, from avalanches is maybe looking at smaller features of a similar aspect and elevation the day before or a couple of days before. Um, Tiptoeing into that terrain, really, um, you know, that last slide, when all think five things together, that's when you can go big, you know, on those micro features, you need to build up your personal confidence that, that the picture that you're creating is the right picture. Um, and the avalanche forecast is just one information point. I think I tried to make that point is really it's up to you to create that rich picture uh, of information. Um, and the avalanche forecast is just a starting point to do that. Great. Um, uh, good question from Kelsey. Uh, how often, in, in short, uh, how often should I replace my beacon? She just got a new beacon and is wondering um, about kind of the warranty on it versus the lifespan of it. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, you can refer to, to each manufacturer's kind of recommendations. I don't want to kind of say something and, and then get a blizzard of hate mail from, 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 from somebody, <laughs> from one of the beacon manufacturers. Uh, you know, uh, 
it's a good idea to have them serviced every couple of years, make sure they haven't drifted up. The really latest ones, they do a self-diagnostic test, and that definitely gives you a little bit of confidence to that they're working okay. But uh, all of these big manufacturers have a surface uh, uh, department. They will run through it and check it for you every couple of years. As to replacing it, the technology is getting better all the time, but... Um, you know, I think I like my analogy of the mobile phone. Are, are, are you happy with an eight-year-old mobile phone, a nine-year-old mo mobile phone? It may work just fine, but maybe you want to start thinking about moving things on five. Depends how much you're using it. It's really difficult for me to say to go and spend 500 bucks if you're using that beacon one week a year, right? It's different if you're out there 100 days a year. So it depends on use, depends on wear and tear. Are you carrying it in a pocket or are you carrying it in a... In a, in, in, a, in a pouch they'll get you know but ultimately think of them they are quite delicate they do have these ceramic um antenna in them you you need to be kind of quite delicate with them don't throw them in the back of the car you know in, in your pack in the back of the car i don't lend mine to anybody because i i'm worried that they may drop them and it, and it appears fine but maybe that ceramic antenna might have a crack in there it'd be really you know so part of the answer to question is well how much are you using it how well are you looking after it um you, you know but the, the, the industry standard is three antenna beacons all three antenna beacons are good to go really and, and they've been around for a while now but um i'd say the first generation of three antenna beacons are now starting to become to the point where they're ready to be kind of replaced by something new if you've got one of the very first three antenna beacons i'd be looking to replace even that now Let's, uh, we can take a live question here from Jameson. Uh, Jameson, I think you are, oh wait, here we go. Oh. Still on mute there, Jameson. Let's see if we got that. Yeah, yep. uh, we, we got gotcha. you. Hey, gentlemen, thanks a lot, Mike, for doing this. I appreciate this. And uh, I listened to the Esau conference and saw a lot of continuing questions about spatial variability. And that's mm -hmm. a huge issue that I've run across um, being a backcountry skier here for a number of years now. We get the avalanche forecast, the weather, and kind of gauge a big picture of the problem that we've got going on. And then once you get in the terrain, I was wondering how you assess the risk factors um, when running into spatial variability. What is your decision process? Because I saw a lot of questions regarding that and figured I'd word it in that way. <laughs> See what you think. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And as a forecaster, we use, um, you know, from a spatial variability point of view, we talk, we talk about a problem, a, a specific avalanche problem being, is it widespread or is it confined to specific terrain features or is, or is it isolated? Uh, you know, as a, as a practitioner, as a, as a skier, or, or, you know, even as a guide, I guess, um, you know, going back to a previous answer on the previous question, it, it, it's our mindset as we're going out is the onus is on us to build that information picture. Am I seeing avalanches? Am I hearing reports on social media about avalanches for last year? I've heard nothing at all for four or five days and I'm feeling nothing and I'm seeing nothing. Well, then my confidence in relation to that avalanche problem is slowly rising. And so at that, that point, I'm, I'm willing to move into bigger, more consequential terrain, but it's a slow, deliberate process. It, we talk about spatial variability a lot in relation to uh, stability tests, right? A, a compression test or extended column test. Um, and um, yeah, and again, they're, they're just an information point. Uh, the, a problem that we have with people uh, in, in in Europe, if, when they have a little bit of avalanche training, is they're just desperate to go dig holes in the snow. But ultimately, it, it, it's and when people come on our courses, it's like they're kind of disappointed that we don't do an awful lot of digging. It's like ultimately, it's just a point of information at that point in the snow, and it's a really good one, and it's quantifiable, and that's great, and we can share it, and it and it, and it gives us some 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 good information. But it may be different twenty feet away. And the way I'll use a stability test will be 
to say no, but not go. I'll use it. As if a stability says I'm um, getting a strong result of, of an energetic fracture or of a weak structural issue, I'll make that as a decision maker not to, to tackle a slope, but I'll never use it as, uh, as something to confirm uh, a good stability of that. Does that, does that make sense? So is it safe to say that you would uh, um, get the full picture uh, based on the forecast, based on the weather, uh, based on everything that was previously discussed earlier and utilize an extended column test or some sort of uh, stability test, or I know we've been talking about rather viewing them as instability tests mm. in order to gauge what's going on for that spatial variability scenario? Yeah, no, that, that, it, it, exactly. I think I like that term instability test because the temptation is to do the test and, and not get a really uh, energetic result. And it's like, well, you know, it confirms you want to ski that line and I'll, and I'll dig a pit at the top of that line and I don't get a result. So that means it's okay to ski that line. Well, that's not the case at all. Um, you know, it's, it, it's almost backwards to that. Um, use, use that test to say no, but but, but, but never to say go. The, the, the go decision is that slow methodical pro problem. People are looking for a silver bullet. They want this, this trick that that means to make a, a go or no go decision. Uh, and unfortunately it just doesn't exist. It, it, we need to build that process up. And, and, and if you're out every day as a mount professional, that's a much easier process than if you're just uh, going out at the weekend. But, you know, you, that, that because of the internet, that, that information gathering process can be all the way through the week till the point that, you know, come Saturday, you, you're actually at a quite a high degree of confidence before going out. Um, you know, so we do have quite a lot of resources available to us. Um, uh, but nothing really beats a, a bullseye uh, uh, feedback from the mountain, right? When we're actually out there at the time, at the day, what are we seeing? What are we feeling? Uh, and if we've seen that for two or three days, then our confidence is definitely going up. No, I, I appreciate that. That, uh, that pretty much uh, nails it on the head there. Since we deal with so much wind loading and so much uh, issues with uh, variability, depending upon which ravine we're in, which uh, slide we're skiing, yeah. Um, I and that, you know something like fat map there is because your terrain there is so complex you know it's it's easy to lose track of what aspect you're on when when, when you're up there right it just everything's just slightly off and it's just like things aren't lining up and what you think is maybe northeast or northwest isn't and then also as you the problem with wind of course is as well is that you're dealing with localized winds that'll put localized wind slab and then you've got you've, you've got cross loading as well so yeah no it, it's tough it, it is tough for sure yeah well i appreciate that i saw that question come up a couple times and i won't take up any more of your time because i'm sure uh, a couple people have some more questions to ask you but i appreciate that i saw that come up a number of times throughout esau mm. great thanks jameson um if anybody else has any more questions, uh, type them in now or, or raise a hand. Uh, the last one I have here uh, is from uh, Wes. A uh, little bit of a heuristics question, uh, human factor. Any recommendations for climbing or ski partners having different levels of comfort or, or risk um, when you're traveling in the same group? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The simple blunt question is find someone with the same kind of risk tolerance as, as, as yourself. Um, um, because if, I, if I've got a really low risk tolerance uh, and as I get older, it, it, it is getting lower and I'm with somebody with a really high risk tolerance that they're going to be bored and I'm going to be terrified. And uh, that doesn't really make for a good day out for anybody. Um, so it's great to be able to match up partners in, in, in a risk acceptance kind of profile. I think that's kind of really useful. Um, yeah, does that make it, does that, is that a short, sharp answer to, to that question? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great answer. All right, any last, um, any last questions from anybody? Raise your hand now. Um, 
Well, we, we obviously, we want to thank Mike for this. Uh, he, it's, I believe, uh, right around two in the morning where he is in France. Uh, so bravo, Mike, for uh, doing the, uh, this, uh, such a, an awesome presentation at that hour of the morning. Uh, we hope you get some sleep. Yeah. Um, we have some, this is going to be a series for us. So, you know, Mike is actually doing another talk on uh, January 25th. Um, before that, next week, we have uh, Nikki Champion of the Utah Avalanche Center, who's going to give a presentation on the 21st. Uh, and then uh, looking out a little farther, Al Mandel of Acadia Mountain Guides on, on February 4th. This calendar is on the uh, MWAC website. Um, check that out. And we'll also make sure to keep social media up to date with all of this, uh, all of these events. Um, another thing just to plug is, is to check out the MWAC uh, YouTube, which uh, we've kind of been trying to add stuff to that and, and get some more people like following along on, on video and observations. But uh, if there's nothing else, Joe or, uh, or Mike, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, yeah, great. thank you, Mike. Really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll 